Hola bandidos, ¿cómo estamos? Welcome to Mel's Magic. I'm Magic Mel, and this is Owl, my spirit guide. Yes, I got it right, because <laughs> it's always mirror reversed on the computer, so sometimes I do the wrong movement. How are you guys doing? I'm recording this on a beautiful Friday, 30th of September morning. As you can see from my outfit, it's autumn here by now, and I'm really welcoming this new season. The summer here has been fab, but hot, hot, hot. <laughs> to the point where, you know, like your brain is like marshmallow and you just can't do much in that heat. So I'm really welcoming these lower temperatures and to see the light also change. We live here on the Costa Blanca in Spain and the light is beautiful, especially the autumn and spring light, the angle of it. So I went for a walk this morning, just reveling in the beauty of nature and feeling super blessed walking through the forest and watching this magic unfold, just a play of light on the plants. And I was so inspired that I said, okay, I'm going to record one of my videos. And this is supposedly season, sorry, episode one of season five. And I'm actually going to stop numbering them here when I talk about the episodes because I get really muddled in my brain. I'm just going to record and then afterwards I will categorize the videos into the correct season. However, this marks season five and the beginning of autumn here. So welcome, welcome. How have you spent the Virgo, new moon in Virgo and the full moon in Libra? How has that affected you guys? I definitely I'm synchronizing more and more with the, the the cosmic calendar and I'm very much more in tune with the moon which again here is a blessing because you know I can go outside and see the beautiful moon and she's gorgeous 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 and synchronizing with the moon gives me a sense of rhythm it grounds me and it makes me feel connected to the cosmic rhythm I feel that's super super important nowadays for us to find a way to connect to our nature and in that way connect with nature out there and you can do it either way i mean it's it's related no but if you can find a way to to tune into the season out there and find a way to maybe perhaps with the lunar calendar um take each, the energy of each season into account. For example, with the new moon in Virgo, I thought, okay, Virgo is all about organizing and um, letting go of things that you no longer need. Um, what was the right term? Going through your stuff, basically, you know, and, and filtering, there you go, filtering. And I thought, well, I'll take that energy, new moon in Virgo energy, and I'll really declutter my space. And it helped me declutter my mind, you know, as without, so within, as within, so without. And then the full moon in Libra encouraged us to really reconsider the way we operate in our relationships. And I reflected on that and looked first at my relationship with myself. And then I observed myself, how I operate in my external, my outer relationships. And that's actually something I want to expand on in a minute. But again, I encourage you to tune in to the lunar rhythms, new moon and full moon. Take into account whatever the, the astrology says, you know, whatever energy is being encouraged in that, in that lunation. And see if you can if you can work with those energies. It definitely has helped me again reconnect to a larger to a larger web, a larger mechanism. So let me just ground myself a little bit because actually what I'm doing right here is what I've been putting into practice. I've been practicing grounding into my body more, being here, right here, right now, not just in my mind, but 
present with my emotions and the sensations of my body. And this sounds so basic, no? but to be honest, in my story, um, I've spent most of my life disconnected from the very presence, which is my body and my emotions. I always operated from about here to here, and that includes, that actually maps where my breath is stuck. It's usually stuck somewhere between here and upper part of my chest. So by grounding myself, I'm using my breath as tool to anchor me deeper into the presence of my body and the presence of the present moment. And it's unfamiliar. I think I've mentioned this in one of my previous videos. It's, it feels unfamiliar because, again, I usually operated from a constricted state of being. And that constricted state of being was induced by an underlying current of chronic fear or anxiety. So now when I tune into my breath, when I have these body check-ins several times a day, I often realize that, wow, I'm still, you know, the breath is still only up to here. And then I consciously bring it down deeper into the belly, lower chest, belly, solar plexus, and I try to relax, you know, through the breath. And I've been doing this for a few days now and it's, and it's shocking for me to realize how ingrained this constriction is. And I have to send a lot of compassion to myself. A former version of me would be probably punishing myself like, oh, you're still in that mode. No, I'm out of the self-beating um, dynamic. I'm trying to practice presence and compassion with myself in whatever happens in the moment. So when I realize that, wow, I'm still constricted, how, like how many times do we need to practice it? We practice taking a breath deeper. I tell myself, it doesn't matter, Melanie. We'll do it as many times until it's a new, almost like a new neural pathway, no? Um, these wonderful neuroscientists out there, they tell us how practicing a new thought, a new way of thinking takes, well, it takes practice and initially effort because the old neural pathways are so entrenched. It's like a self-operating circuit. It's like you're, you know, when you drive to work and you know where you're going, you can basically just switch on to autopilot and think about something completely different and you still get to work because we've done it so many times. So creating a new neural pathway, creating a new habit takes some effort in the beginning because our mind and our body are getting used to this new circuit, new state of being, new way of thinking. In my experience, I promise you it's worth it and it works 100%. It takes a lot of perseverance, compassion and patience. Again, three virtues that were not natural to me and that I'm putting into practice. Why? Because underneath it all, I intend to come from a place of self-love. Yes, from a place of self-love. So, let me recap. What I'm doing right here is another practice of mine where I allow myself, I give myself permission to take it at a pace that feels comfortable, natural. So instead of coming from the thought, ooh, I cannot just stop, I must continuously speak to you so as to come across as coherent, I'm dropping that. Because I'm constantly practicing calibrating into presence. And to be honest, negative space and silence are just as necessary to enhance the power of the word or the power of, if you're a musician, the note you're going to play. 
the silence almost highlights what is being said. So I give myself permission from now on to speak at a pace that feels grounded. And if there are silences, I honor the silences. I will not push myself to perform. And this is naturally leading me into a big topic, pushing myself to perform. We all know the topic of dismantling the patri patriarchy. You know, it's part of the zeitgeist, you know? but what does it mean for us personally? I can only speak from my experience. Pushing myself to perform was my way of bulldozing my natural rhythm, my natural pauses, my natural need for rest, my natural seasons. A former version of me would constantly push myself to perform, regardless of what my body was signaling me, regardless of tiredness, hunger. And if I really observe that kind of, that way of operating, that is patriarchy operating within me. It's a disconnection from my body's presence, my body's needs, and it's completely, it's an operating system that comes from here, from the head. I should, I must, I have to, those kind of sentences I'm sure you're familiar with, no? So, I'd like to just share how how crucial the connection with our body and our emotions and our feelings is to create a different reality. And before even creating a different reality, I guess how crucial the body is to understand yourself. Our feelings and our emotions, energy in motion, our nudges, our, our compass, and I was the first person in the past to bulldoze these because I didn't understand my emotions and didn't know how to process them. I didn't know how to communicate them. So I just repressed them and it caused, it made me very, very ill. So I've mentioned it a few times. A lot of you know this, the famous 2019 breakdown, but I have to bring it up because it was a turning point. Um, it was the hallmark of me bulldozing myself. What has this got to do with patriarchy? Well, or capitalism in the wrong sense, is that in that state of being, we completely operate from the mind. We're disconnected, I'll say it again, from our own needs, from our body's needs, from our own inner compass steering us in that way, the mind saying, no, we go this way, it causes this rupture within us. And it manifests on a larger scale in a rupture with nature out there. How can we expect, let's put it really back to basics, how can we expect to create or witness or experience a peaceful world if there is conflict within us? How can we expect overconsumption to stop if we ourselves as individuals keep on trying to fill a void that's within us with external things? Overconsumption is a symptom. I've witnessed it. that overconsumption, even addiction, is but a symptom. And it comes from a need to feel something. And that something is, in my life, this void I used to feel. 
since a little child, there was always this hole in the pit of my stomach. And the sense of insecurity, the sense of unanchoredness, uncenteredness, disconnection, rupture. I remember drawing a lot of sketches when I was younger of me kind of, you know, these torture devices where I think the person was being um, entrenched in, in, in these, in Comuna Rueda, like a wheel, and it pulled the person apart. I know it sounds horrible, but literally emotionally, that's how I used to feel. Constantly being pulled in at least two directions and me being at the center going. Ugh. And the way for me in the past to deal with that, to deal with this disconnect, this void, and the belly of emotions, I, I used to call it, I, I used to repress my emotions into the belly because I didn't know what to do with them. And I used to use food to do that. I wasn't bulimic, but I had an eating disorder. And I look back with so much compassion because I didn't know better. I didn't know what to do. It was my way of protecting myself against the world. I, I guess with the food, it created this sa satiating, feeling and it obviously I, I I put on weight and it created like a buffer between how vulnerable I felt at my core and how I perceived the world as a dangerous place I was trying to protect myself the symptom was stuffing myself and we can substitute the term stuffing myself with an, like an open bracket you can insert anything you want alcohol food, cigarettes, any addiction. I, I want to extend so much compassion with anyone who has an addiction because I've experienced that and it came from this need to ease the pain in the moment regardless of the the destructive consequences further down the line. In the moment, for example, when I was smoking, it soothed my anxiety. In the moment when I felt empty and innerlich zerrissen in German, internally torn, I used food to soothe that to soothe that pain. It was, it was essentially a form of pain. So again, pulling the thread back to the argument of patriarchy, how is it related? Well, if we at our core feel um, an intrinsic void that actually only our self-love can fill, but we're not filling it with self-love, what other methods are there? Overconsumption, addiction. How does that relate to patriarchy? Well, <laughs> I mean, I don't watch any, any TV anymore and I'm really watching my space nowadays, but I go out into the world and I see it everywhere, in the supermarkets. We use things to fill that void and, and the world feeds that story in us. Oh, you need this to feel good. You need to become this to feel better. I mean, the story, the narrative is that predominantly, no? The narratives are out there. The main narrative is escape yourself. Don't sit with it. Distract yourself. Fill the void. Buy this. Go get that. You need this. Do you see the relation I made with this inner void and overconsumption. And we know what the production, <laughs> the overproduction of goods does to the planet. The overconsumption of resources. I think, as far as I remember, Tara Brach, she's a wonderful a spiritual teacher. She called it the hungry ghost who never gets satiated because that part of ourself who wants to be, that wants to be satiated is, has been rejected by us. 
And as long as we don't sit with that pain and try and work through it with help if needed, then that dynamic will, it's, it's on auto loop. Nothing can satiate it, nothing can fill it. So grounding myself is a way for me to come in touch with the remnants of my old programming. And I want to create the correlation here, the hungry ghost and um, living in fear. The void I used to feel in myself was essentially created by this complete lack of self-love. It took a lot of lessons to come to that realization. And it's only now that I'm trying to sit with all my emotions and all my needs, my body's needs, my needs for rest, my need for whatever that may be in the moment. It's only now, now that I'm filling my own void with my own source, my own energy, my own love, my own care, that I do not need the external things anymore. It's interesting because I am, you know, I live in Spain. I love my, <laughs> I used to love my glass of wine, but you, now it's just, I realized it's been a few weeks now. I, no me apetece, we say in Spanish. It doesn't entice me. And even cigarettes, you know, I used to smoke roly here and then, but now it's like, oh, it's almost like it naturally puts me off. And this is not coming from a place of judgment, you know. I'm just realizing how I'm feeling and I was thinking about it like, oh, I wonder what that is or how that evolved. And I, I realized, you know, I don't need those things anymore to soothe me or to make me feel better or to distract myself from the emotion. If you watch the last three episodes of season four, You can witness there my struggle with being present with my emotions. In one of the episodes, I was sharing how I felt, you know, I wanted to escape myself, I wanted to escape my body, I wanted to go home, <laughs> home, <laughs> kind of source. But it doesn't work like that. The courage and the transformation happens as soon as we sit with whatever is present. Sit with the discomfort. And it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to feel uncomfortable emotions, you know? I mean. But I just realized that running away is not an option anymore. It, it's like sweeping, it's like sweeping dust under the carpet. You're like, okay, I can do this a few times, but eventually that that fluff ball is gonna grow <laughs> and somebody comes mail is that your cat and I'm like no it's like all the dust i swept on the carpet it doesn't work stuff always comes back to haunt us especially emotions we can't just make emotions disappear we need to feel them feel them and that's where the courage where, where we need to be courageous be present with them and then we can release them and often you know, so many have said this before, teach Nathan, Eckhart Tolle, if we sit with it, we actually don't need to do much. It, it dissolves naturally because we are allowing whatever is to be present, whatever emotion there is, whatever feeling there is, to be there. We're not pushing it away. We're not resisting it. And by creating that space of allowance, it's like, you know, holding a baby It's it and, and rocking it by soothing it by self-soothing the difficult emotion poof, dissolves and you know i also used to think <laughs> i used to be very absolutist 
oh, I just have to do this one time and it's going to be good. No, gosh, it's like over and over. But it makes sense if I think about the time I was functioning out of fear and how that has ingrained into my system, my way of thinking, my even my way of standing and walking, how rigid, how constricted I used to be for such a long time. I can't just expect myself to like snap into this new mode. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's a practice. It's a practice. And I, I don't think we can determine, okay, on this date, at this point in time, I'm going to be done with it. No, you deal with it as it comes up in the moment. Hence the importance of presence, hence the, mo the importance of grounding. Yeah, and that kind of grounding allows us to really be present with ourselves, to be intimate, to see into ourselves, and then to understand also, okay, if I'm feeling anxious, or first let's take it to the symptom, of, oh, I notice my breath is constricted, what's going on? What is the trigger? Oh, I feel stressed. Okay, what's underneath? Oh, I feel scared. Okay, what's underneath? Oh, I feel I'm not getting enough done. Okay, what is the very core belief? I'm not enough. Again, it was Tara Brach who calls it the th golden thread. Radical acceptance. And it's really extending this kind of patience and compassion to ourselves to Why? To get to know ourselves. The big sentence, know thyself. How do we do this? If it's not through understanding how we operate. How? Well, by observing, by witnessing um, our reactions to things, our bodily reactions to things, our emotional reactions to things. That's how I get to know myself. And then I can look at the core belief and then decide, well, is this still serving me? Is this useful? The answer be, might be, well, it used to serve you. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. But is it still useful for the person I am right here, right now? It's extending that kind of compassion and creating that kind of space that allows for free will, conscious choice, and not repeating a pattern of karmic reactions. And it's mind-blowing how the most basic thing as the breath can provide this kind of opportunity for self-discovery. It's, it's insane. <laughs> It's also fascinating. I mean, I keep on saying it. Let's look at this process, this transformation, this journey as an adventure, as something so miraculous and so privileged. The privilege to get to know ourselves, the mystery of, of who we are. <laughs> and in the process, it, yeah, it takes dying to a lot of versions preconceptions of ourselves, versions of ourselves that maybe were, were functional at a certain point in time, in a given moment, because it allowed us to, to survive. But as this journey unfolds, we're given the opportunity to really look at things and look at behaviors and thoughts and beliefs and really ask that crucial question, does it still serve me? Is it aligned with the kind of person I am becoming or want to become? Yes or no? And these are questions only, you know, we, we ourselves can answer for ourselves. It's a very intimate you know, you might say lonely journey, but there's so much beauty to be found in this process. 
I wanted to talk about also my my still present inner conflicts. You know, I don't have it all figured out, and I've also dropped that expectation off my shoulders to have it all figured out. Dude, nobody has it all figured out. <laughs> we are a process. The body is a process. We are continuously unfolding. And the best I feel I can do is, again, this notion of presence. What's coming up right here, right now? What needs to be held? What needs to be allowed? What needs to be held with compassion? And understanding what my emotions and what my body is telling me. That's a, a whole other topic. For example, I'm a generator, human design generator, three slash five. Meaning I have a... But I, uh, my decision making is most aligned when I listen to my gut. And ironically, as I told you before, I used to use the gut to repress my emotions and it made me so sick. You know, clinical depression up to a point where I was, um, you know, I had suicidal ideation. It made me so sick. The fact that I was not going with my gut and I still struggle with it. Because the mind is so quick to come in and rationalize things. But I tell myself every time, well, you know, Melanie, it's not worth betraying yourself anymore. It's not worth going against the truth of what you're feeling. We know how what happened when we did that, when we disregarded that. We're not going back there. And I'm definitely not doing that in a you know, monumental sense anymore. But even with small decisions, sometimes I'm, I still find it difficult, you know, okay, I decided this, but my, I, th I feel, I, th I shouldn't say I think I feel, but maybe my body is telling me something different, but then my mind comes in, oh, is it? Or are you just being difficult? You know, that kind of over-rationalization, my mind's very quick to jump in. So my challenge and opportunity, I don't want to call these, confrontations problems they're not they're opportunities for self-discovery so my opportunity at the moment is to really be unapologetically in favor of my sacral and gut response and not over rationalize not overthink it not doubt it it's just okay your body is saying this basta we don't need to justify it it might seem irrational to other people it might even seem irrational to yourself but it technical glitch <laughs> so the whole point is not to rationalize it the gut has nothing to do with your mind with ratio and to accept it and i must say it's a challenge it's not easy for us overthinkers it's not easy and it's funny when i went for my walk i allowed myself i don't know if you uh witnessed from i think it was episode 19 or 20 of season four where i was so proud of my new moon in virgo schedule I made for myself, you know, in a plan, I'm going to be organized. I kind of, I really, I'm proud of myself because I give myself permission to totally ditch that um, schedule if I feel differently. So, for example, I usually do my meditation in the morning, but this morning I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for a walk. Why? Because I feel like it. Bravo. And on the walk, I came across these two amazing stones. So wait, let me show this one first. This one is, it's crazy because it looks like a pretty nicely chiseled cube. See, you see, yeah? And the other one is this very amorphic, organic shape. And I was thinking, oh my Lord, that's exactly how I feel. My mind is this square thing. And then my gut is this undefined, um, organic shape. And I want to bring these two in balance. So yes, I definitely want to follow my gut, but I also don't want to punish my mind, castigar la mente. It's another topic, but you know, we need to be compassionate with our minds. There are these wonderful tools and computers. Do we nourish our mind? Do we treat it with respect and with care? Do we give it a break? You know, it's all stuff to consider, and it's not, ooh, the gut versus the mind, the heart versus, no. 
I keep on emphasizing it's about integrating and honoring the role of each one. This is a great tool, fantastic, mind-blowing, literally, tool. But our center, our compass is this, heart space and gut, and our emotions. So how do we work with these shapes instead of trying to force one into the mold of the other? How do we bring balance and integration into our being? Again, I'm using the tool of the breath because it brings me into what is right here, what needs to be looked at right here, right now. And it helps me align these different components of my being. I told you in at the end of season four that I was going to do something completely different, Mel's Magic. And I feel, you know that, I'm trying to find my voice in this process. And I've decided I want to be more free-flowing, I want to be more spontaneous, I want to be less, you know, really stiff. I want to flow more. And be present with, yeah, be present with my posture, my breath. Just continuously find new ways of being authentic and expressing myself in a way that feels good to me. All right. I hope something here resonated with you. Somebody actually sculpted some, commented that I should make a live stream. I'm going to look that up. I think it's where I stream live and you can we can interact. That'd be great. I'm going to check that out. I'm not the most tech wheezy person, but there's hope for my analog state of being. <laughs> so I just want to pull a few cards. Since, yeah, I want to, I want to pull two cards vale? for you, for me, for anyone, for all of us here present through this beautiful connection. And it's a blessing that we're in this time where we can connect like this. Wow. So I'm clearing the space, connecting to my angels, spirit guides and ancestors. Please give us a card of advice for all of us present here in this video. Thank you so much. I love this. I'm getting to know this new deck, the Psychic Tower, a friend gave to me. I had to stop myself because I was buying so many decks. I'm like, oh, and that one too, and this one too. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have a slight obsessive streak when I'm into something, into a topic. Or let's say I'm passionate. <laughs> that sounds more, more positive. Okay, let me focus. Let me ground myself. One card, please. One more. Okay. Prosperity begins. Isn't that a beautiful card? And I love just looking at it, the hand gestures. You know, our hands are so powerful. They, the energy we can emit through hands is incredible. So the fact that here we have these two hands almost in a mudra, it looks to me like taking care of this seed we've planted, this seed of self-love within us that's filling that void we used to carry. By nourishing that, prosperity begins. So I just want to remind you that all of your efforts in self-care, in nourishing yourself, in deconstructing old conditioning, it's worth it. You're doing great. And because things unfold in divine timing, you know, and our minds operate in a linear way, maybe sometimes manifestations of your efforts are not visible or as visible as you'd like. But I promise you, all your effort is worth it. And in divine timing, things will unfold. Don't lose faith, okay? Know that prosperity begins right here, right now, because you've chosen a different path. You've chosen to heal yourself. And that's a, it's a hero's journey. You know how much it took to, in each moment, step from fear into love, and we're still doing it. It takes continuous courage, strength, and perseverance. So acknowledge that, how far you've come, and 
know that by healing yourself, you are raising your own frequency and that of the collective because we're all connected. Yeah? I have a pool mechanic coming now, so I don't, I need to stop here. But I hope this card speaks for itself. You are the gardener of your own consciousness, of your own reality. Plant the seeds that you want to see grow and have the patience to watch them blossom. Vale? Thank you for being here with me. I'm Magic Mel. This is my spirit guide, Al, one of them. And I send you infinite love and gratitude. I'm seriously super grateful to have you here with me watching um, my own process, my own transformation unfold. And I look forward to sharing more of my thoughts, experiences and insights with you in the next video. If you like my video, you can hit the like button. It does help me a lot. It helps my channel grow. You can subscribe for more videos. And I appreciate it if you share it with friends and family. And if you comment down here, okay? And I'll try and check out this live stream. <laughs> Analog Magic Mail is going to check out live stream. And I just want to also say that I have a donation link down here in the description box. My PayPal link. If you feel you would like to donate, I'd be super, super, super appreciative of any donation. It does help these videos come flowing. Okay? So, mucho amor. Take courage. And Al and I... Oh, Al and I have your back. Ciao.